And I've been doing this off and on for years, but in updating it, I'm happy to tell you. Um, and and I do talk, have pictures of people periodically, but the stars are the buildings, and not to, which is not to say that the school is a, is a place of, of great masterpieces. There are some good buildings, and I think one very important building. Uh, above all, I just think it's an interesting story. And um, I'm going to cover the ground fairly uh, quickly. And some of you have probably seen this before, but I'm banking on the fact that you won't remember a thing. So uh, <laughs> um, here we go. OK, now <clears throat> I get a kick out of saying that, uh, that uh, the history of the North Shore Country Day School begins in the primordial ooze of ancient Kenilworth. <laughs> And uh, that's over the top, I admit. But this is Kenilworth Avenue in the 1890s. Look at those little saplings. It really does look pretty raw, doesn't it? And uh, around this time, the uh, village invited Mr. Francis King Cook from Chicago to start a school for boys, which he called the Rugby School for Boys. And we think, it's now a little unclear, we think this is the, uh, one of the buildings that he used, now a house on Leicester Road, and it was just a few days ago that it occurred to me, wait a second, Leicester Road, I wonder if that has anything to do with the Leicester Hall at school, which it might, we don't know, but at any rate, this is, this is, this is the first, you know, this is Cook School. Um, uh, rugby, well, within 10 years, in 1900 or so, Kenilworth was starting its own public school, and Mr. Cook uh, pulled up stake and moved uh, a mile or a mile and a half to the north to start another school. And uh, this was, he called, the Girton School for Girls. So we have the Rugby School for Boys, and now he has the Girton School for Girls. And he acquires, purchases this property at the highest point in, in Winnetka, the, the old Garland Estates. In 1874, look at that baby, uh, a wonderful uh, Victorian um, uh, Italianate uh, 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 towered building. And uh, this, was, this was the main building, but a little bit to the to the uh, west was the coach house of the Garland Estate, uh, uh, and that was that was the that's how the Girton School began. Now it lasted about 16 or 17 years, and uh, for a period of time it was quite prosperous. And he ended up building, or they ended up building, three more buildings, which you're going to see pictures of. And so there was a real campus. I mean, you know, it wasn't just an old house and the coach house. There was a campus that occupied this site. Uh, unfortunately. The school fell on hard times in the middle of the teens or so, and by 1918, 19, a group of parents in Winnetka uh, got together to form this new progressive school, the North Shore Country Day School for Girls and Boys, K-12, and, and this was the first uh, campus. They, were, they, leased, they leased the property for Mr. For Mr. Cook to, to see how things would go, and, and so, uh, what, so the school had this sort of instant campus. And uh, there he is. <laughs> I had to, <laughs> yeah. And of course, they hired the young, uh, dynamic uh, uh, Perry Dunlop Smith to be the head and, and to, to lead this new this new uh, this new enterprise. Now, this this is not this isn't you can't see this very well, but I'm going to zero in on a few of these buildings. This, I believe, is the oldest picture of the campus of the North Shore Country Day School. Now, Sierra points out that the Historical Society has yearbooks from the Girton School, which I've never seen. This I took from, I believe, the first yearbook, which would have been, I guess, 1920. And it's not a true panoramic picture. There are series put together. But it, this is the campus of the school, the new school, from uh, another building that was part of the campus, which I'll get to in a moment. But on the far left, we're moving from east to west or left to right. No, we're not. We're starting with the building from which this picture was taken, which is Lester Hall. Lester Hall uh, got a new site at the southeastern corner of the campus some years later, but it was originally where the tennis courts are today. Probably built 1912, 1913, we don't know for sure. So a Tudor, Tudor style building, and I think we have a picture of the new, the, yeah, there's, the, there's the painted, the new, you know, the new look for Lester. So anyway, that photograph is being taken, or those photographs from Lester Hall in its original position. So there, there is the, uh, the, the Garland Estate, or which came to be called Knowsley. Now, I'm not going to dwell on this, but if you are sharp, you'll notice that the tower is lower than it was in that earlier picture, and it's lost its porch. They already began to monkey around with the building uh, uh, during the Girton period. So this is how it looked at the beginning of North Shore. Uh, next up, 
is a building that was built again in the teens. Now we're talking about the whole campus. This is the, this is the gymnasium, very simple barrel arched uh, uh, building, uh, which is uh, roughly behind the auditorium, was behind the auditorium today. Next up uh, in, the, in, the, in the back a little bit was a building that was called Elliott Hall. And uh, probably again, 1914, 1912, uh, vaguely prairie style, the, 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 the modern style of the period, uh, which housed the middle school for a long time at North Shore. But again, these are the very first buildings, so this is 1920 or so. And then the, uh, the coach house uh, at the west end of the campus, and, uh, uh, and then what's the... Oh, yeah. Right, sorry. Yeah. That was the that was the that was the, uh, the, uh, the the campus for a couple of years uh, while the school was an experiment. But within within a short period of time, it was clear that the school was going to be a success and it was going it was going to you know it was going to last. And so uh, and these these buildings, this hodgepodge of buildings, were were not adequate. So uh, Smith and the board got together and began to talk about a grand plan. And this is the early 20s, which was a very important time in Chicago's history, hence this slide. The implementation of the Burnham Plan was going on the building of Grant Park and also North Michigan Avenue. Let's see, did I? North Michigan Avenue was uh, taking shape. This is a few years later. So it was a very exciting, exciting time for Chicago. Uh, and there was a lot of money, you know, in the in the economy. Think times were booming. Winnetka began to think big, and North Shore Country Day School was thinking big as well. So and there's a connection, by the way. Winnetka had its own plan of 1917. And uh, a key building in this plan was a new village hall. And it, it, it so happens that the architect of this new village hall uh, was also the architect of the new buildings, the soon to be new buildings at the North Shore Country Day School, Edwin Clark, who also, by the way, designed the Indian Hill Club that you're in right now, the first building. So Clark is the, uh, and he's a school parent, one of the founders of the school, so it was logic, logical to turn to him. And he came up with a scheme for a new series of buildings in this early 20s period, which was the scene of so much excitement in Chicago and in the area, as I said, in Winnetka. And here is the scheme. I hope you can see this recently. It's a nice a drawing of, of a series of buildings that form a vague, sort of a, sort of a, a wall uh, facing an open space, a green, a, 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 a garden, a large park-like space. They're Georgian, tr traditional, handsomely done, and it was this scheme that would be the, the, the master plan for the school for quite a few years. Uh, things didn't turn out exactly the way this picture indicates, but it was pretty close. Oh yeah, I, I, what he was thinking of, among other things, was the sort of New England, the New England green idea of Georgian buildings facing such a space. And here is, is that idea come to life at Western Reserve Academy in Hudson, Ohio, which you may have seen, I don't know. But in any case, it, it, when I saw this years ago, it struck me as, as you know, a little bit similar. Okay, here we go, so what happens? First of all, here now we're, this is, this is, this is 22 to 27, roughly. 1922, the first, the new high school building, Dunlop Hall goes up, which I've always compared to a sort of a New England, uh, 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 you know, uh, meeting house. Um, and notice the shutters on the windows, which would disappear later. So it, it, it had a charm to it that it would, it would lose a little bit later. Um, and then the second building in the group, 1924, was a little behind the wall facing that part, uh, which looked, uh, looked, or looks like a, a little bit like a congregational church with that steeply pitched roof and the cupola and the pediment and the big arched windows to house a gymnasium. And then the final building in this series is the grandest of the buildings on the campus and the one that is the most, uh, most prominent, particularly on its position facing that green, the auditorium building uh, with, again, the cupola, the pediment, uh, and, a, uh, and a series of columns. So a little, a little fancier than the, uh, the, than the one you just saw, than the old gym. Uh, the columns were a little fatter than the ones in the original drawing, and, and it, it doesn't have quite the refinement and the elegance, but it's still a very handsome building, I think. So there you have it. We're now in the, uh, well, we're, there you almost have it. A couple other projects occurred. Uh, oh yeah, this just shows you the, the, the new auditorium on the right in relation to Knowsley Hall. Don't forget Knowsley, it's still there. The Garland House is still there up at the top of its hill. A little bit out of place amidst this Georgian village, this Victorian grand dame. 
uh, a couple other projects in this amazing period of the 20s. A, the Diller Street used to go through the campus, was closed, or was, was I should say, was, it was uh, cut off about uh, a third of the way along. Uh, the school traded a piece, of, a piece of land, which is now a small park uh, on, on Church Street between Church and Green Bay Road. In, uh, in, in, in exchange, they were able to close, close off the streets, which made the, the campus safer. And uh, at the same time, roughly, I think they acquired the, the farmhouse at the far northwestern corner. And now you could have playing fields, and they'd be they'd be safe, as I said. So it really was becoming a true campus in in a in a, in a grander sense. And finally, the moving, remember Lester, the oldest, bill, still today, today the oldest building on campus. Lester got moved from its position where the tennis courts are uh, near Diller Street to its current position. And this is why little joke slide I used to, before people could zero in on it, I'd say, Perry Dunlap Smith, to save money, had the kids drag the building across the campus. <laughs> He's really supervising the tug of war, which you can obviously see. <laughs> Okay, so um, this is the late 20s when all this happens, and uh, uh, the depression hits, it's not an easy time for the school and for a lot of the parents, but the school survives, and even prospers to an extent during this period, to the point at least, where in the late 30s, Perry Smith decides that it's time to get rid of that old coach house, remember, and build a new building which would be for the lower school. Mr. Clark said, wonderful, do you remember my, uh, my plan? And here I think is the plan, yeah, there it is. There's the new building you're talking about. Smith apparently said, no, I don't want a traditional building. I want a new building. We live in a, we live in a new era of new architecture. Uh, my friend Carlton Washburn is doing a new kind of building a mile or so away, uh, the, the Crow Island School. I want something else. Uh, I don't exactly know what he said, but that was the gist of it. Clark, uh, and, and what did he have in mind? He had in mind the, the architecture made popular or made, made uh, 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 pe pe made, uh, people made aware of at the 1933 World's Fair. This is a, one of the houses of tomorrow at the fair. And he was also talking about the flat roof, and so he was also talking about the, uh, the, the uh, is, this, is this the yeah. Crow, Island. Uh, Crow Island School, which is probably uh, the first uh, modern school design, I think, is really in the United States and tremendously influential. So he, 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 he had seen the drawings for Crow Island, he had been to the fair, uh, he wanted something new. Uh, Clark, I don't think it would, be too, it would be too much to say he was broken hearted, but he was annoyed. And so he turns the project, it still is for him, he turns the project over to a bunch of young Turk architects in his firm, including Franny Stanton, class of 1927, who had graduated from Yale a few years before and was working for Clark. And they're the ones who came up with this snazzy new modern design, which Clark had no uh, patience with, apparently. And um, oh yeah, this is this is this is one of my favorite pictures from uh, from one of the yearbooks, showing an hourglass with the old coach house up on top, and those two figures are Perry Smith and Mr. Clark, and then it's disappearing, and, and down below, voila, the new modern flat top, blocky um, uh, uh, kind of building. And Sierra found this wonderful picture, I don't know if you can see it too well, in which it talks about the new fangled uh, ventilating system called air conditioning, and uh, the glass blocks that you could kick, and it wouldn't break the glass. And in, in other words, this was a really, uh, up-to-date, uh, avant-garde building uh, in, in every respect. And here, here it is. Uh, and it really hasn't changed that much. The, the windows have changed, but flat top, uh, blocky, and as I like to say, racing stripes, those dark horizontal stripes running across the facade. No traditional detailing whatsoever, or very, very little. This is about, uh, this is about it. Do you see those, those columns, those fluted columns, that is, those grooved columns that are sort of, that have shrunk from those big, fat columns in front of the auditorium? That's about it in terms of traditional, and it really isn't very traditional. And Smith, uh, leading or having some, making some sort of comment uh, or uh, uh, supervising some sort of event at the uh, opening of the school or close to it. Here's how it looks today. So the windows have changed, but it's still fundamentally the same high ceiling, uh, light filled, uh, uh, still kind of modern uh, modern design. 
and uh, the, uh, the, the, light, the lighting fixtures have changed, but light still pours in through those windows. And it's important to realize that Smith wanted the faculty involved in the design of the building. They're the ones who insisted on light and as much light as possible. But my favorite, and other things too, my favorite example is that Smith designed the desks for the kids. And there was one little drawer that the, that the teacher couldn't open so the kids could put their little, you know, secrets in. <laughs> I don't think that would work today, but at any rate. And, and finally, the desks were manufactured by the prisoners at Stateville near Joliet. Isn't that wonderful? So uh, I don't know. Those, those desks, or one of them, should, should be saved. I don't know if the many still exist. Probably not. But the interior has been redone, but it's still, as I said, it still has that, that, I think, 1930s modern kind of feel to it. So here's the campus, 1939 or so. Um, showing this, this mixture of periods, the, the Knowlesley on the left, and, uh, uh, and then Lester, I'm not sure Lester's in the picture, but uh, is still there, Elliot's still there, and then you have the new lower school on the right, so it's uh, an interesting mix of, of buildings. Uh, another 15 years would go by before the next building, and this tends to be the case, 15 or 20 year intervals is, uh, mark the, uh, the, uh, the, building, the major building periods. And this would be a pretty important period uh, in terms of history, two wars, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the onset of the baby boom, and also important history in the school itself with the, uh, the retirement of Perry Smith in 1954 and Nat French taking over uh, at, the, at that time. And here's a picture of Nat French with the students looking over blueprints so you know what's coming. The next major building period in the history of North Shore is really already commenced, but most of it would occur under, under uh, under, uh, under French. And here is um, the first project, which began while Perry Smith was, was in his last year and it was named after him, the middle school building. And I, I, if, this were a, if this were a test, I would ask you to uh, uh, look at these two pictures and tell me uh, which, which direction is this building going in. Remember, 15 years has elapsed since the lower school. Which direction is, is it going in terms of style? Uh, we're looking toward the lower school, that's one direction, or uh, is it toward that direction? And if you fail to get this right, you would be thrown out of the class because you would be totally inept at identifying styles. But obviously, the middle school of 1955 is looking back to that lower school. So even though a fair amount of time has elapsed, modernism is still in the saddle, and that's the way to go. Whereas the Georgian building from 1924 is very much antiquated. So uh, an interesting little point. Um, I don't have a picture of the architect of the of the middle school building, um, at Denison Hall. Some of you may may know know, know the family, or but uh, this guy was very much uh, instrumental in the next projects. This is Robert Parker Coffin, and he uh, he designed he worked on on. on three projects of bubble. One was the uh, renovation or remodeling of the upper school, which has just occurred again, as Tom said. But here is the 1960-61 uh, the project. You can see they ripped the building apart, uh, gutted it, and, uh, and basically in a fairly short you know, summer and maybe a little bit of the spring, they, they were able to create a new a new interior. So that's one project. They ex it's now larger. Um, it's lost its shutters, for what that's worth. Whether this was a stylistic thing or a cost thing, I don't know, but it's lost its shutters, it's a little bigger, and it's new on the interior. So that's project number one, early 60s, 1960. Um, and oh, this is, this is the way it looked until fairly recently. And notice that little, keep this in mind, that little, uh, that little canopy at the entrance here on the north side. But uh, okay, project number two. You can see what's happening, I think. Knowlesley is coming down. The old Garland estate is biting the dust, and, and this, this, uh, uh, this happened pretty rapidly, uh, and uh, this is 19, again, 1959, 1960. Not a peep of protest. Today, people would be, be, be rioting. Preservationists would be, would be, you know, just up in arms, and I would be among them. But at this time, nobody really cared that much. These buildings were considered old-fashioned and, uh, and just and, and hard to maintain, which they were. Uh, and so, without much fanfare, down comes the the grand old Nosley. And here, these are from the the pictures are from the Wilmette Life of that uh, that year. And all that's, I think the sign is still there, uh, all that's sort of left to, uh, to remind us of this building is the uh, sign identifying the top of the parking lot or the whole driveway as an Oldley Circle. Okay, 
Number, project number three, again, remember Robert Parker Coffin again, is the new gin, uh, which I think was a real uh, stroke of genius in a way, maybe that puts it a little too much, but to, to embed it into, sink it into that hill of, of rolling down to Church Street, because it was a large building, it would have dominated the campus had it been built on the, you know, at the, at the top of the hill. But here it is being built into the into the hillside. But on the other side, on the on the on the west side, it's 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 rather low low uh, in profile, and it even it, it even makes a nod to the old auditorium building and that pedimented uh, entranceway with the columns, which is which are still there, of course. It, these are squared off columns, and it's very simple. Nevertheless, it is a gesture to history I think and here is the uh, here is the here is the history and I, I thought well, could we call this an early example of postmodernism no I don't I think that's going too far but nevertheless that's kind of the, the you know it's, it's a it's same same idea the final project in this period is the 1965 Nathaniel French Art Center and this is this is a building that uh, was was it's the old it's the old uh, gym uh, which uh, you can see between the uh, the auditorium on the left and the, o the old the older gym the other gym on the right and so the building was was knocked down and here's a picture of the demolition of that building and a new building was simply dropped into the slot and it's 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 hard to see really it's not freestanding um, but uh, it too it seems to me makes a gesture to to the past which was not true with the middle school. In the lower school buildings. There, the gesture are those the little arches on those windows. Now, you may say, yeah, this is, come on. But it's a simple building, admittedly. But nevertheless, it, it, does, it does attempt to, uh, you know, as I say, to, to make a nod to another period, which was not true with the other ones. Okay. Um, um, this, is, this slide represents about eight years of school history, that is the late 60s and the early 70s in particular. And uh, this is a period when there wasn't any major building, probably thank God, because the energies were spent elsewhere. And I try to illustrate this with the, uh, with the, uh, the golf team barbarians. If even the golf team can look like this, you know you've got trouble. And, and this, is, this, in other words, is the is the wild the wild seventies, the tumultuous seventies, which was really a nasty period in many ways. Very difficult. Oops, um, I'm getting to to Dick in a second. Um, George Eldridge became the head after Nat French left, probably glad to pass on the baton, and, and George did his best to keep a lid on things. Finally, finally, you know, sort of threw up his hands and decamped to the Royce Moore School in Evanston, where he was the head of the upper school. And uh, Doug McDonald came in uh, as head for a few years, again, no buildings, and in the late 70s, so we're covering about 10 years rather rapidly, Dick Hall becomes the head, and he would uh, be, uh, take that, have that position for about 10 years. So again, we're talking about another 15 or so year, 20-year uh, period um, uh, elapsing, and it's time to, uh, to think about a new building. And, and Dick and the faculty and administrators and the board all thought that, you know, the school really uh, has an inadequate library. And if any of you remember the, uh, the library at the top of the upper school, it really was a dreary place. It's giant open space fringed with, with, with books on, in, in the shelves and not, not, uh, not inspiring, not a, not a good, good library at all. So the school needed a new library. And the question was where to put it and how to do it. And they hired the firm of Chicago firm of Nagel and Hartray, very good firm, by the way. And, uh, and Jack Hartray himself came over and looked around and, and, and came to the hall, apparently, and said, Dick, you know, um, the last thing you need is a new building in this place. There's, there's so many and so close together. I think we should, we should kind of, uh, uh, you know, keep it out of sight, give it a low profile. So this is the first scheme for the new library, which would be uh, dropped into the largest space at the center of the campus between the middle school and the, and the old gym and the art center. Um, and the interesting thing is the building indeed got built there, and it was that kind of low-slung uh, situation. But look at the windows. This, this, is, this, this was rejected uh, for whatever reason, stylistically or cost, I don't know. But that's not how it turned out, even though everything else about it is pretty close. Here is the... Uh, um, oh, yeah, this is, this is a slide that Sierra found and that I got a big, we both got a big kick out of, this is an odd cake, what's the deal here? Why this cake? This is marking the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, laying of the cornerstone and, and the uh, groundbreaking, I should say. Why, this, why the cake in that shape? Because that's the shape of the building. So anyway, here is the way it turned out. Remember those windows, the horizontal band is replaced by those vertically placed 
uh, or I should say, uh, vertically oriented, rather traditional windows. Um, and that, uh, and the plaza became known as the Eldridge Plaza. And notice the, the, the shrubs on top, so it's sort of a, a, a green roof effect, which was a new idea as well. And this becomes sort of the hub of the campus as well. This is another important thing. It's at the center roughly, it was open, it was connected to the middle and lower schools, easily accessible from the upper school, so it really became kind of a center. And um, it becomes known as the uh, Hall Library for Richard Hall, the uh, headmaster, but uh, also uh, it's important to mention the important, the, the great contribution of Julian, Park, uh, Ju Julian Parker Hall in, in, in creating this building. Oh, there's another view of the, of the somewhat traditional windows. Julie Hall, okay. She becomes head in the, uh, in the, in, in the early 90s after a very brief headmastership uh, uh, under Dean Lanfear, and uh, she, building on the legacy of Dick Hall, it really reinvigorates the school and launches what I like to think, or helps launch what I like to think of as the, uh, as the, the late 20th century, early 21st century boom at the North Star Country Day School in enrollment, in, uh, in reputation, in financial matters, uh, uh, you name it. And no, now buildings weren't built during Julie's uh, Julie's tenure, but uh, uh, there were some interesting projects, some small-scale projects that were done, which are are important. These these little things make a difference. The the, the school had a pretty uh, uh, dreary sign before this new sign was put up. Also, this ratty old wall was replaced. The ratty old wall along Green Bay Road was replaced by this retaining wall and fence, and. Um, there's the fence, and new playgrounds. Now you might say, hey, wait, that's not new, and you're right. Sierra found these pictures of old playgrounds and other, it's a fascinating story, the history of playgrounds. So here you see a playground, I think roughly 1929, this is you know, the, the evolution of playgrounds at North Shore, and another one maybe 10 years later, and then, uh, uh, and then finally we've gotten to the, this is the playground built during Julie's period, named for George Mitchell, who worked for so many years at the school, and uh, and this is the current playground. These playgrounds change fast. So this is the this is the newest incarnation of the playground at the at the top of the uh, of the of the circle. Um, and let's see. So now we're now we're in the in the early 21st century. We have a new headmaster, whom you heard speak a few minutes ago. New at this time, and uh, uh, the middle of the decade is rolling around, and uh, the school is ready to build again. It would be again. This is 20 years since the middle 80s, about 2005. Um, everyone or many people who observed the school and, and thought about the school realized that it had an inadequate science uh, uh, science uh, science facilities. And so the priority was, was put there, and a new science center was built at the same time that the middle and lower schools were renovated. And uh, Nagel and Hartray, again, were the architects. And, and once again, they, they believed in keeping sort of a low profile. And so the building doesn't tower over everything else. And it sits on the, the frame, the structural frame that had been designed for the library. Uh, and it was designed to, to, to carry more weight above it. And so it's sort of a vertically extendable building. Not 50 stories, but still that's what it is in this. And so the building goes on top of the, of the library. My favorite uh, picture of it is on the other side uh, to show the glassiness of this building. This is new. This is a, this is this is you know modern modern sort of glass walled architecture, and this is this has come back or in, in popularity in the last fifteen or sixteen years. And I think this is a very handsome example of it. And you might say, isn't that a bit of a jarring contrast between the stucco and the red brick? And well, yes, it is. But but so what? I think I think it works. I think it's handsome. <laughs> And this is a grand analogy, but I feel a little bit the way about this that I feel about the Renzo Piano glass addition to the Art Institute. It works. Um, okay, and now we're, 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 we're only five years later. And you, if you remembered my earlier comment, 15 and 20 year intervals were pretty common. So what's going on? Why so soon? Well, what's going on is success. Success in enrollment, success in finances. There is money to be, to be to, to available for this. And so we have... Um, we have uh, this most recent, or this very recent project, the redoing of the upper school, which is really very dramatic. And this is a view, this doesn't show the drama quite as, as vividly as the next slide, which I leapt ahead to. But the building was gutted, the roof is new, the, uh, the, the, uh, the windows are new, uh, they repainted, of course, and, then, and the inside, new spaces were carved into the building, new furniture installed, new colors, new, new technology, new everything. It's really, really amazing. And 
the architect, Trung Li, Vietnamese-born guy with Canon design, very much wanted to express the modernity, the newness on the exterior, and the school, to its credit, let him do it, and they didn't have to. I'm trying, wait till you see this next slide, or you, if you, know, you haven't seen the building. Uh, here it is. I mean, oh. that's a pretty dramatic, uh, uh, if not shocking, you know, contrast, although I love it. I think it's great. Yeah. Inside, I only have one picture, but you get a little the idea of how they carved this V-shaped space into the building and the colors, and, and you've got to see it to, to, to really appreciate it, but it's, it's very dramatic. And, and now, of course, uh, as Tom said, uh, the current project, which isn't quite done, but nearing completion, is the interior uh, remodeling, remaking, really, of the, uh, of the auditorium and the uh, art center. Okay, the end. Thank you.